For 10 years, the War of Spanish Succession ravaged Europe. Fought between the alliances of the Bourbon and Habsburg dynasties for ultimate influence over Spain's empire. With the Bourbons eventually emerging victorious in the Iberian theater. In 1710, the French Duke of Vendôme led the Bourbon Spanish army of Philip V to victory in the twin battles of Brihuega and Via Viciosa. Well into the next year, he would chase the beaten Field Marshal Stahenberg into Catalonia, the most pro Habsburg region in all of the Iberian Peninsula. In the following offensive, Girona fell to the Duke of Noailles French Army of Catalonia, as well as Balaguer. The overall condition of the Allied army was poor. Stahenberg possessed only 6,000 of the men he originally campaigned with. There were 8,000 more to pull from the Catalonian army, but these men were fit only for garrison duty, and could not be relied upon in a real battle. Stahenberg requested Admiral Norris's British fleet to bring imperial reinforcements from Italy to Spain. Amazingly, this request would be fulfilled, and that May his army would be boosted to 29,400 men. This however proved insufficient, for the Bourbons also received 5 regiments of cavalry and 15 infantry battalions for their summer campaign, boosting their forces to a total of 53,000 men. French troops had been freed from duty elsewhere, meaning King Louis XIV of France could send his grandson far more substantial aid. For the rest of 1711, Vendôme and the Duke of Noailles would probe Barcelona from three directions, but they would be stopped cold by delaying actions at the fortresses of Cardona and Tarahana. The skilled defense of these fortresses emboldened the Allies so much that they even took to limited offensives. In October of 1711, Stahenberg dispatched a smaller division under Baron von Wetzel to take Tortosa. However, it would only serve as a reality check to Stahenberg's ever hopeless situation. Despite his reinforcement and bold defense of his flanks, the army he had was still greatly outnumbered, outgunned, and lacked some of the most basic provisions. The year would end without much change. Come the campaigning season of 1712, the situation changed not just from immediate action, but also from events happening elsewhere. The main powers of the Grand Alliance were beginning to fully realize the consequences of what was an attritional war that dragged on far longer than either side anticipated. Financing it had become beyond burdensome. The Allies, especially Great Britain, were also pressed at home by the high number of casualties taken in battle, as well as increasing division between field commanders. That May, Britain made clear its intentions to pull troops not just from Flanders, but Catalonia as well. The Habsburgs and Dutch would attempt to continue the war for a short time, but hope for victory was dashed after the disastrous Battle of the Nain and the subsequent loss of all they had spent years campaigning for. Thus, the Emperor Charles saw the situation in Spain no longer tenable. These events would press the Allies to formulate a treaty with France. First, the Emperor would propose a separate peace with the Bourbon Spanish King, Philip V, in which Spain would be divided into an Austrian and Spanish realm. However, Philip refused to accept the independence of a regime in Catalonia and consequently the southern region of Aragon. So instead, he agreed only to cede lands he had actually lost during the course of the war, as long as he retained his throne. Negotiations continued well into 1713, as Britain established diplomatic relations with Spain in an effort to resolve this so-called case of the Catalans. However, Philip continually denied their independence, to the theory of the Catalans themselves. The Spanish ambassador in London, the Marquis of Monteleon, assured that the nature of the Catalans, always prone to sedition, detailing that their privileges limited Spanish royal authority and that the misfortunes that in all time Spain has suffered for them, referencing their numerous revolts against the crown of Castile. To satisfy the wants of the British, 
Philip ceded Gibraltar and Minorca in exchange that he offer a general amnesty to the Catalans. This amnesty, if implemented, would come at the cost of their constitution, along with the abolishment of all their laws and bodies of government. The privileges of the Catalans are, in truth, desirable for a people who long to be entirely free from dependence on their prince, and to live with his arms and hands. But the privileges of Castile are of infinitely greater value to those who they propose to live in due subjection to the authority," wrote British Secretary of State Henry Bolingbroke on the case of the Catalans. He would also later shoot down a proposal for a neutral Catalan Republic. In response to protests, he would respond with, Maintaining the Catalan liberties is not of interest to England. Emperor Charles helplessly complied, agreeing to evacuate his imperial troops from Catalonia. The remaining Dutch and Portuguese would follow. Catalonia stands alone. Furious would be an understatement of how the Catalonian public and their leaders felt about what they perceived as the greatest betrayal. Their allies that promised to protect them had all but abandoned them, with virtually no say of their own on the diplomatic table. Bourbon troops now occupied town after town, announcing the end of hostilities. The deputy general of Catalonia was ready to submit to Philip, but a radical group of Catalan aristocrats convinced them to instead participate in a Junta de Bracos, or General Assembly of Arms. On June 30th, the moderates and radicals of the most influential Catalan nobles convened to decide the fate of their country. In a long, complex series of back-and-forth debates, the citizens' estate, military arm, and the reluctant deputy general agreed to continue resistance, despite the odds. During the convention, it was said that, It is our duty to conserve the freedoms, privileges, and prerogatives of the Catalans which our predecessors obtained at the expense of glorious bloodshed, and we must likewise maintain, which have not been taken into consideration either in Utrecht or in Los Pitele. On July 9th, a war at all costs was declared. Infuriated by such opposition, Philip would write to his grandfather, The Catalans will pay me all the expenses of the War of Catalonia from the 1st of July until they have surrendered their arms. To him, they had committed the crime of rebellion against a legal treaty, and now they were to be treated only as rebels not subject to the laws of warfare. They will all be put to the knife, and those who defend themselves will be hanged. Because in addition to deserving this punishment, as obstinate rebels and thieves, it will be convenient to be executed in this way, for example of the others. Two days after the Catalonian declaration, Philip declared war in turn, and both sides took action. In Catalonia, leaflets were read publicly everywhere the Bourbons had not occupied, announcing the new state of war as well as the creation of the Junta del Trentesis, or Board of 36 the new governing body of the country. The army had been reduced by the evacuation of allied troops from Spain, and it would need to be rebuilt from the ground up. Appointed to lead the new army was the experienced Antoni de Villaruel, a former soldier of the Bourbon Spanish army, who in 1710 sided with the Habsburgs. That same year, he distinguished himself in the Battle of Via Viciosa. Over the summer, eight new infantry regiments were raised, alongside numerous regiments of militia volunteers. The fledgling Republic even managed to scrounge up a small armada of around 50 ships to oppose any blockade. Moderates who opposed the war had either fled or were forcefully expelled by radicals from the capital. On the other side, Philip V had been reorganizing the large army to invade Catalonia. Leading 11,000 Frenchmen, and 14,000 Spaniards was the Duke of Popoli, a veteran soldier who coincidentally had unsuccessfully defended the city in 1705. He would be advised by the Captain General Prospero de Verbum, an excellent siege engineer who had been captured in the Battle of Almenar in 1710, 
then released in 1712. In mid-July, Popoli's advance initially met only token resistance. By the 25th of July, his army arrived outside of Barcelona, yet he would not lay siege to the city just yet. He instead threw up a blockade to some protest from his own staff. This would allow Viroel precious time to prepare the city's defenses, as well as form the new regiments into professional soldiers. The initial blockade itself would prove less than effective. The besiege had little trouble smuggling in arms and supplies. Popoli's reasoning for a blockade was not without reason, however, for outside Barcelona lay the remainder of Allied strongholds from the war. So he instead focused on the exterior fortresses that he had already bypassed. Most of all, the defiant Cardona. Catalan authorities envisioned a plan to trap Popoli's blockading army on two fronts for the ongoing uprising in the countryside would provide Barcelona with fresh volunteers. An expedition under military deputy Antony de Berenjo and the cavalry general Nebo managed to slip past the French blockade with around 300 light troops. As they entered the interior of the country, they would recruit 5,000 volunteers, immediately sending 1,000 of them to reinforce Cardona. Pursuing Bourbon troops would make the pincer impossible, however, and the other 4,000 would have to be abandoned. Such failure resulted in the imprisonment of both men as they returned. The only hope of trapping Popoli had slipped from their grasp. Nevertheless, resistance to Popoli's army had been reinforced outside of Barcelona, and these raiding volunteers, known as Michelets, would wreak havoc on Franco-Spanish supply lines. For Villaroel, more fortune had come his way, for on September 2nd, a small Catalan fleet broke through the blockade, capturing two Spanish ships and establishing a limited supply line through Mallorca, Sardinia, all the way to Naples. In response, the Duke of Popoli commenced a short bombardment on Barcelona, which had little effect. From late October to the end of November, small-scale actions would take precedent. Though one sortie led by Villaroel himself would nearly result in the capture of the Duke of Popoli. But the most important change would occur in Barcelona itself, however, for on November 30th, St. Andrew's Day, the radical Rafael Casanova would be elected as chief counselor of Barcelona, effectively making him the highest authority of the city and Catalonia. He had much experience governing the city during the siege of 1706 and was the most trusted among moderates and radicals to govern what had become the main bastion of war against Philip V. While the campaign of 1713 came to its end, a trade treaty between Spain and Britain had been formalized. Part of the deal would involve British naval assistance in the blockade of Barcelona, as the continued support of Charles VI by the Catalans was viewed as a violation of the Treaty of Utrecht, part of which further detailed the evacuation of foreign powers from Catalonia. In the meantime, Popoli had been turning his blockade into something that resembled more of a formal siege as his own forces slowly conquered the Catalan interior. During the winter, he began the construction of a line of circumvallation around the city, securing the army's placement and its flanks. However, raids on several points of the line by Villaroel, known as the Fortnites, would tie down 10,000 troops from the blockade. It also delayed the completion of a circumvallation to January 30th. The Catalonians inflicted heavy losses on the advancing Bourbon troops, but no matter how many they shot down, more would fill the ranks. Villaroel and Casanova had very little to replenish their losses. Throughout the next few months, little significant action would take place on the battlefield, but instead on the diplomatic table. While Villaroel took the opportunity to further train his troops, a peace between the Holy Roman Empire, its allies, and France had come underway. One of the most important treaties to come out of this long negotiation was the Treaty of Rastatt. It would not be formalized until March 7th, 
and it really only included a peace deal between France and Spain on one hand, and Great Britain and the Dutch Republic on the other. Philip V had made sure none of it applied to the Catalans. Initially, the full details of the treaty did not reach the citizens of Barcelona, who believed that France would withdraw from the blockade in order to honor the new treaty. As Philip V attempted to negotiate a surrender, his diplomats only found the city reinvigorated with false hopes of liberation. In contrast, the government of Casanova, now known as the Junta del 24, knew they could no longer depend on diplomacy to win. They were beginning to realize that there probably wasn't any winning at all. On May 16th, they convened with all the senior officers to vote on a resolution. Villaroel, exhausted by the constant meetings, conferences, and rejection of diplomacy, warned that he would attend, quote, But nor should I vote, since I have already obeyed His Majesty's orders in this part. Later, the Council of War resulted in a unanimous resolution to fight to the last drop of blood. Worse was to come. With the people of Barcelona unwilling to surrender, Duke Popoli used the lull in time to turn the blockade into a more proper siege. On the 17th of May, Popoli's men would attack the Capuquin convent, located on the hill of Montcavari. A Bourbon battery of 16 pieces cracked open the walls of the convent, allowing Bourbon troops to surge in and take it under heavy fire. The hill of Montcalvari offered the Bourbons a better position from which to bombard, as Popley's gunners obtained total oversight of all the city. He bombarded not just the city defenses, but also civilian homes and workplaces. The population fled to the beaches, which were just out of range of the French guns. Once again, the city has narrowly escaped a crippling blow. The siege having dragged on for just under a year, and to Philip's frustration, there were no signs of capitulation. The emboldened Catalans were resolved to fight to the end, regardless of their chance of victory. However, such tenacity was yet to be truly tested. Veteran French troops from the closed theaters of war were pouring in all over from the north. The countryside, although in rebellion, was being slowly overrun and the arrival of reinforcements would bring in a new commander for the army of Catalonia, the Duke of Berwick. July 6th, 1714, James Fitzjames, the Duke of Berwick, assumed command of the Franco-Spanish army, laying siege to Barcelona, replacing the previous commander, the Duke of Popoli. With Berwick came more reinforcements, infantry, cavalry, engineers, supplies, and plenty of artillery. These men were veterans of the great battles of the War of the Spanish Succession, which just ended for most of its belligerents. Beforehand, 39,000 men were posted to Catalonia. Now that number skyrocketed to 86,000, an average of one French or Spanish soldier per Catalan family. Beric was also an experienced commander. He first served in the Nine Years' War in the service of the Jacobites. Their defeat by William III of Orange drove him to join the French army. Later in the war, he led a division against the Allies at Steenkirk, where he distinguished himself. He once again offered his services as the new war broke out. He would win the Bourbons' first decisive victory at the Battle of Almanza, wherein he outmaneuvered and destroyed an Anglo-Allied army led by the Earl of Galway. It's no wonder that he was the man appointed to conquer the last stronghold of Philip V's enemies. Beric began his campaign by completely rejecting Popoli's blockade. He was advised by Verboom to shift focus to the northeastern side of the city. During his time as a prisoner in Barcelona, the Dutchman took note of weak points. He found the terrain optimal for digging, and the interval between the Santa Clara and Portal No bastions 
could provide room for sappers to break through. During the night of July 12th, 2,500 French sappers dug toward their objective. They worked fast, for the next morning the breach was nearly complete, and the first parallel had been built. Villaroel took notice, and the next day he led a sortie of 4,000 infantry and 500 cavalry to destroy it. The attack was initially successful, but the resistance of the Bourbon infantry was far stiffer than expected. Losses are unknown, but Villaroel's men paid a higher toll than they wished, so they slipped away back into the defenses. The sortie failed, and the first parallel was finished. On July 16th, a second parallel had come under construction. Franco-Spanish sappers dug tirelessly, while under heavy artillery fire from Barcelona's walls. Losses were quickly piling up, so Barrack had artillery and mortars placed along the second parallel as quickly as possible. These large batteries provided enough cover for the men to continue their work, and heavily damaged bastions of Santa Clara, Levante, and Portal No. The Catalan gunners' respected accuracy and coolness under fire stood no chance. Several breaches were made, and one much larger in the soon-to-be-named Royal Breach. Mere days later, the third parallel would be completed. Villaruel had been surprised by the speed of barracks engineers, and frightened by their potential. The third parallel was being used by Bourbon engineers to begin excavating tunnels at the foot of the walls. Villaruel knew that they would be placing mines there soon, and that he had no time to remove them. It took a little longer than anticipated, but Barrack would finally decide to launch the first real assault on August 12th, on the Santa Clara Bastion. On the early morning of August 12th, French sappers primed explosives under the bastions of Santa Clara and Port Alno. Before long, they erupted in a burst of flame, disorienting the Catalan defenders. Company after company from the battalion stormed the two bastions, actually managing to capture them for a short time. Catalan professional troops, with city militia, counterattacked. The sanguinary combat will last all day. The French Artois infantry suffered the most, losing most of its officers. And finally, the fighting came to an end when the company of law students, a company of one of the city's militia battalions, drove the last assailants out at bayonet point. The Catalans reported 78 killed and 118 wounded. Beric had lost 900. The failed assault was dealt a major blow, but the marshal wasn't ready to quit. Instead, he used the cover of night to organize another assault. The objective was still the same, and this time he personally organized the vanguard and directed the artillery to fire only on his order. Villaruel also shifted his forces, leaving 170 men from two companies of the militia to hold the Santa Clara Bastion while a more mixed force of regulars and volunteers held the Port d'Alnou. He also brought up additional artillery support. At 10 p.m. on August 13th, the Bourbon's guns opened up. Barrick used this as a feint to confuse the Catalans into believing a general attack along the whole line was to come. This fire covered the first wave of sappers, who cleared the rubble from the breaches but it was only a matter of time until they came under a shower of bullets from the defenders, which initially prevented them from advancing. In addition, the French vanguard followed up in support too soon, and both elements began taking heavy losses. These mounted as another company and the regiment de Putasio poured fire into the Frenchmen stuck in the moat. It took two bloody hours, but the sappers finally cleared the way and the Bourbon troops poured in, taking the barricades in grim hand-to-hand -hand fighting and wiping out most of the defenders. The regulars sallied forward to drive them back, but in vain. 
The regulars fell back, and the French took the center of the bastion. Now they would just need to hold on to it. Barrack's fainting attacks had worked, and Villaruel only now noticed he had been tricked. He then ordered three battalions of the regulars, and another 700 strong militia battalion, to immediately retake it. They attempted to deliver a crushing blow while the Bourbons were still organizing, but they found that the enemy was far more prepared than expected at the foot of the breach, and the Bourbon infantry repelled two assaults that night. The savage melee continued early into the next day. At one point around four in the morning, musket fire had become so intense that it ignited a magazine near the Catalan barricades, killing 70 of them instantly and sowing panic in the rest. The defenders nearly collapsed, but Villaruel personally intervened, rallying the troops and bringing forward fresh companies to relieve the decimated units that had been fighting all night. The Bourbons kept fighting as well, but they were not relieved, and now they only possessed half of the bastion. To relieve their own men, the Bourbons brought up the elite Spanish and Walloon Guard regiments to make the next, and hopefully final, assault. The Catalan counterattack began at noon, just as the guardsmen raced up to the breaches to make bears. However, they could not reach their barricades in time, as the fresh defenders charged down the rubble in a pincer movement, trapping those who could not escape, and killing them. Casualties on both sides were said to be high, but specifics are unknown. Beric could only face the truth of this botched endeavor, and wrote to the king. Your majesty will see, as far as I am honored to tell you, the enemies defend themselves desperately, perhaps better than regular troops would, so that this work becomes serious and long, since it is not advisable to risk again an action of some importance before putting ourselves in a state of attacking the breaches of the place, since this could kill our troops and we would lose our best men. We will move forward as wisely as possible. The Bourbon officers had become impatient due to suffering two defeats in a row, in addition to months of slow progress. They begged Beric to try again, but the marshal refused. He would instead adopt a new approach. He opted for a systematic bombardment of the walls for several more weeks. This, he hoped, would create larger breaches for his battalions unlike the smaller ones that funneled his troops into killing zones before. In the city, morale on the Catalan side was high, but their numbers were rapidly dwindling. It was only a matter of time that severe starvation and disease, as well as limited ordnance, took full effect. Casanova had pin hopes on the partisans and professional troops still fighting outside of the city particularly those of the Marquis of Paul. This was not without reason, for the partisans had won a minor tactical victory over the Duke of Montemar at Talamanca on August 14th. This did not prevent the Bourbons from winning elsewhere, however, and any attempts to break the blockade had been thwarted on land by Beric and at sea by Admiral Ducasse. By September 3rd, Barcelona was at its limits. Negotiations were initiated, and both sides met to discuss the matter. Beric proposed the terms of capitulation to Casanova, who, in turn, announced a state of the siege to the three commons of Catalonia. There was still two to three days worth of gunpowder left to sustain a resistance, and that a 12-day negotiation would be convenient in this time. However, the proposal was firmly rejected by the three columns, and a message was sent to Beric, stating, The three commons have met, and having considered the proposition made by an officer of the enemies, they answer that. They do not want to hear, nor accept any proposal from the enemy. An exhausted Villaroel requested to leave the city and resign his position. He was told the next convoy out of Barcelona would be on September 11th, 
the day of Barrack's final assault. By September 11th, the defenders had built three lines of defenses and worked on their most damaged bastions. Again, the first defenses were at the Santa Clara, Levante, and Port Alno bastions. However, the weeks of bombardment opened up much wider breaches, especially in the Royal Breach, which stretched 140 meters. In case of an assault, the defenders laid mines below it. All the mentioned areas had been further reinforced with troops and small amounts of artillery. If the Bourbon successfully stormed into the city, La Travesera had been built as a last resort. The last point of defense was the Montuic Castle, on the hills outside of the city. The defenders were down to 6,295 troops, only about half of which were fit for service. In stark contrast, Beric had coordinated an attack surrounding the whole city with 19,000 men. He planned to hit the center defenses the hardest, forcing the Catalan to commit most of their forces there while his wings opened up the gates to his cavalry. Such an assault was designed to force the Catalans to capitulate by overwhelming force. At 4.30 a.m. on September 11th, every gun the Bourbons had fired their first salvo, beginning the assault of the day. Two more salvos followed as the cavalry and infantry advanced in three wings. The first assaults were concentrated on the Port del Nou Bastion by Marshal Castillo's 11,000 men. The infantry attacked the two positions four times, but each time they were driven back by heavy artillery fire. Bourbon cavalry then rode around the perimeter to create further diversions, forcing the decimated Catalan units to divert forces wherever they felt the probability of a breakthrough. Castillo's forces at first avoided assaulting the Royal Breach, fearing the possibility of exploding mines. It was soon discovered, however, that these were inoperable. In their attack, they were at first met with desperate resistance, but more French infantry attacked these defenders from the rear, and the Bourbons had their first entry into the city. Combined forces attacking the Port del Nou Bastion and those pouring in from the Royal Breach finally came together and occupied the long-contested bastion. The fall of the Portal No Bastion made defending the Santa Clara one impossible, and the defenders fell back to the Travesera with those from Portal No. Chateau Forts dismounted dragoons and cavalry, taking the Santa Eulalia redoubt in quick, yet bitter fighting. The defenders fell back again to the Levante Bastion, clinging on in a brutal slugging match with Barrack's infantry. Chateau Fort's cavalry moved quickly along the sea wall as the Bourbons finally began entering the city en masse. Although the Dragoons were repulsed from threatening the flank of the wall, it was becoming clear to the Catalans. They could no longer hold the Travesera. The troops in the Levante Bastion had been overwhelmed, with all but 300 killed. The line was lightly reinforced by the last reserves of the city's garrison. By now, most of these companies number just around 30 to 60 men. But the arrival of these reserves allowed time for the Catalans to hold just a little longer. Villaroel, who had rejoined the defense when the artillery barrage began, personally rallied and organized the line. He had been fighting like everyone else all day, and his professionalism kept morale afloat. At 7 a.m., the Catalans had brought forward anything they had left and organized a last-ditch counterattack. It was led by the chief counselor, Rafael Casanova himself, under the flag of Santa Eulalia. This move was unexpected, taking Beric by surprise. The area before the saint Pierre and jean Carres Bastion saw the hardest fighting, as the Bourbons were pushed back to them. The Catalans then turned their attention to the Port Alno Bastion, the scene of some of the siege's most sanguinary fighting. The Bourbons organized themselves here, however, and repelled the charge. Amidst it all, 
Casanova became badly wounded, leading the city militia. At the Levante Bastion, Villaroel was supported by dismounted cavalry in his attack, driving back the infantry and dismounted troops of the Bourbons. A volley from supporting units halted Villaroel's efforts, however. From this, a musket ball struck one of his legs, so he too had to be carried from the front. The Catalan counterattack had lasted for an hour and a half. It did achieve initial success, but in the end, failed to throw back the French. At 8.30am, Beric launched his own counterattack. The reinforcements and survivors surged forward, retaking their lost gains and penetrating the Travesera in many areas. Fighting continued onto 2pm, when the lines of both sides eventually stabilized. The Catalans weighed the option of launching another counterattack, or choosing to negotiate. With every man engaged, almost every bullet spent, and almost all of the gunpowder used up, it was firmly decided that the time to negotiate surrender had come. Beric's terms involved respect to the inhabitants. He would allow the remaining garrison to retire outside the city without their arms, which were to be placed inside the palace. The castle of Montuic would surrender the same day, and all the remaining horses, wagons, and supplies would be given to Beric. Lastly, the fortress of Cardona, still holding out, would surrender the next day. All requests were fulfilled by the Catalans and Beric kept his word. Everything that the city had ordered was carried out promptly, so that when the field officers passed through the streets, we admired the coolness with which all the common people of both sexes, who worked at the tasks of their trades as if they had never had the martial and intrepid spirits with which, in a year of blockade and more than forty days of siege, they had withstood two formidable armies. It seems to me, said the Duke of Beric, what glory this nation would have acquired if it had made such an obstinate defense in favor of its king," wrote one Spanish captain, Alos. The survivors did their best to return to normal life, even as a third of the city had been destroyed and columns of corpses littered the streets. During Beric's command over the forces besieging Barcelona, it is estimated that 14,200 men of the Bourbon army had been killed or wounded. For the defenders, 6,850 to 8,000 had suffered the same fate. It is unknown the number of civilians killed or raped in the assault of September 11th. On the 14th, the Catalan army was entirely disbanded, their regimental flags turned over to the Bourbons. Those who wished were allowed to serve in the army of Philip V. The three columns and board of 24 were also completely dissolved. Their last order to the citizens was to not show further resistance to the occupiers. They ordered that no countrymen should speak of the past, that the artisans and women work at the doors of their homes, like before the war. On September 20th, Beric had no choice but to finally turn over the city to Philip V. Villaroel and all the other military officers and political representatives of the rebellion were imprisoned. This was a direct violation of Beric's terms, but nothing was to be done. They were imprisoned for 11 years. Some were executed. By 1715, all rebelling provinces, including the island of Mallorca, had been occupied and placed back under the absolutist rule of Philip V. The desperate last stand of the Catalans in their effort for independence had been thoroughly crushed. Their laws, constitutions, and privileges had been dissolved. The September 11th of 1714 remains both a great scar and even a somewhat glorious memory of the Catalan people, who sometimes referred to the rebellion as a separate war. Throughout the next few hundred years, the military rule of Philip V would fade away, allowing for dreams of an autonomous rule in the region to ferment once more. September 11th is locally known as the National Day of Catalonia, and has been brought up in recent independence movements 
as recently as 2014 and 2021. Lastly, of course, it proved to be the true end of hostilities of the 13-year war of the Spanish Succession.